Okay, folks, before I call the meeting to order, I'm, I just want to do a little signposting because there's a whole lot of meetings tonight, so I want to make sure people are aware of kind of the, the flow of things. Um, we are going to start by calling the city council meeting to order, um, but that's when things go a little different. Um, we will just quickly go through some of the very early stuff in the meeting, such as the uh, calling the meeting to order, prayer, Pledge of Allegiance, and some presentations. Um, once those are done, we're going to recess the regular session of the city council meeting, and we're going to hold a couple of different meetings. We're going to hold a village center, local government, corporation, annual board meeting, then the crime control prevention district meeting, then the fire control prevention and emergency medical services district board meeting. And once we're done with those, we will come back to the city council meeting. So, um... I apologize if that's a little confusing. Hopefully it'll make sense as we move along, but uh, just wanted to give you a heads up so you were aware that that's kind of the flow of things tonight. So, so I'm going to go ahead and call to order uh, this meeting of the Jersey Village City Council. Uh, the date is July 17th, 2023, and the time is currently 6.02 p.m. Uh, Madam Secretary, do we have a quorum present? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to uh, invocation and prayer of uh, invocation and pledge of allegiance. Um, I've just got chaplain and then uh, Stephanie Otto, commander of the Jeremy E. Ray American Legion Post 324. Hello, Heavenly Father. We come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. Guide our hearts and our minds in the spirit of fairness, right thought, and speech. Impart your supreme wisdom upon our activities so that our affairs may reach a successful conclusion. Thank you for being our source of guidance today. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have a couple presentations. Uh, we're going to start with presentation of Police Department Employee of the Second Quarter Award by Stephanie Otto. Each quarter, the American Legion Post 324 Jersey Village Police Department Employee of the Quarter Selection Committee meet to review a list of candidates selected by their peers. This is in no way a simple task, as all the employees of the department are outstanding individuals that serve a purpose greater than themselves. For the second quarter of 2023, the American Legion selection for officer of their quarter as officer shall be Securo. Okay. <laughs> officer Securo has shown a high level of professionalism, dedication, and productivity. She loves her job and her work performance shows it. We thank you for your service and dedication to the department and our community. All of these attributes work together to ensure the Jersey Village Police Department works smoothly and provides our residents peace of mind and makes Jersey Village a destination community. Many other officers were presented this quarter. We'd like to thank you all for your service and continued performance and dedication to our community. Thank you. And next up, we have presentation of the Departmental Life-Saving Award to Officers Guzman and Garcia. Y'all come on up. Don't be bashful. <laughs> Mayor, City Council, citizens of Jersey Village, uh, it's my honor to present uh, two awards to to our outstanding officers for a life-saving award. But before we get to the presentation, I'd like to read a quick summary of the events. On Wednesday, April 26, 2023, at approximately 2.07 p.m., 
Officers Guzman and Garcia responded to a residence at the 16,000 block of Alcapuco Drive in reference to a man down in the front yard. Officer Guzman arrived on scene first and found the male lying unconscious, not breathing, and face down in the lawn. Officer Guzman immediately responded, requested EMS to respond and began CPR. Hearing the call for EMS over the radio, Officer Oscar Garcia responded as well. Officer Garcia headed to the scene to assist with chest compressions. Both officers took turns performing CPR until EMS crew arrived on scene and continued to take care of the patient. The patient maintained a pulse, adequate blood pressure throughout the transport to the local hospital. Officer Guzman and Garcia prompt and effective response resulted in prolonging the life of an individual. Their actions are a true testament of the noble profession they chose, showing favorably on the City of Jersey Village and the Jersey Village Police Department and to themselves. Please join me in congratulating these two fine officers receiving the Life Saving Award. Congratulations to all of our award recipients tonight. Thank you very much for your service to our city. Okay, uh, with that, we are going to uh, recess the uh, city council meeting, and we are going to now open the, uh, the meeting of the Board of Directors of the Village Center Local Government Corporation. Uh, it is uh, July 17, 2023, and the time is currently 6.08 p.m., um, Madam Secretary, do we have a quorum of the directors present? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to citizens' comments. Any person who desires to address the Village Center Local Government Corporation Board regarding an item on the agenda will be heard at this time. In compliance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, unless the subject matter of the comment is on the agenda, the board members are not allowed to discuss the subject. Each person is limited to five minutes for comments to the board. Uh, of the comment cards I have, I do not have any that are specific to the Jersey Village Local Government Corporation. So we are therefore going to move on from citizens' comments, and we are going to move to election of officers. And it says board chairperson. That's me. I, I can do it. Please do. According, according to the... Can you all hear me? According to the amended bylaws of the Village Center Local Government Corporation Board at Article 3, Section 1A, the LGC shall have the following officers, a chairperson, a vice chairperson, a secretary, and a treasurer. Each officer shall be appointed at the annual meeting or as soon thereafter as practical. The term shall be for one year or until the next annual meeting. In the past, the mayor has been appointed as the chairperson. The mayor pro tem has been appointed as the vice chairperson, the city secretary as the secretary, and the finance director as the treasurer. This item is to elect the chairperson, the vice chairperson, the secretary, and the treasurer to serve until the next annual meeting or as soon as practical thereafter. Great. Thank you. I'll leave that up to discussion amongst the directors. I think if it's the way it's been, I think that's fine keeping it that way, unless anybody else has another opinion. No, I would also move that we, or second her motion, that we reappoint all the same members. Okay, I'm going to take that as a motion and a second to reappoint the existing officers. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. 
Uh, that brings us to item D, consider approval of the minutes of the Jersey Village Local Government Corporation board meeting held on September 12, 2022. Lori Cody, board secretary. We just need to have a motion and second to approve these minutes. I move that we approve the meeting minutes. All second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Uh, and that brings us to adjournment of this meeting of the local government corporation and brings us to we're going to I'm going to go ahead and call to order uh, this meeting of the board of directors of the Jersey Village Crime Control and Prevention District for July 17 2023 the time is now 6 11 p.m. Uh, Madam Secretary do we have a quorum of directors present yes Great. Thank you very much. Uh, that brings us to citizens' comments. Any citizens who desire to address the Crime Control and Prevention District Board regarding an item on the agenda will be heard at this time. In compliance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, unless the subject matter of, this, of the comment is on the agenda, the city staff and CCPD members are not allowed to discuss the subject. Each person is limited to five minutes for comments to the CCPD Board. Uh, again, of the comment cards that I have, none are particularly pertinent to the Crime Control and Prevention District and so I'm going, I'm sorry. Uh, is this regarding the bond issue or regarding public records? Okay, thank you. So then we're going to move on to uh, item C, election and appointment of officers, president, vice president, and secretary for the term, which will begin July 18, 2023 and ending July 17, 2024. Lori Cootie. Yes, so according to Section 363.103 of the Local Government Code, the board is, shall elect from among its members a president and vice president, and the board shall also appoint a secretary. The secretary need not be a director, and the person who performs the duties of auditor for the political subdivision will serve as the treasurer. Accordingly, um, all officers of the CCPD will serve a term for one year beginning July 18, 2023 and end July 17, 2024. This item is to uh, satisfy the requirements of 363.103 by making those appointments. And traditionally in the past, the uh, city uh, mayor has served as the president, the mayor pro tem has served as the vice chair, and the city secretary has served as the secretary. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, discussion amongst the directors. I would go ahead and move that we nominate uh, the current officers to their to retain their positions. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? The motion passes. Uh, that brings us to item D, consider approval of the minutes of the Crime Control and Prevention District meeting held on July 18, 2022. Board Secretary. A motion to approve the minutes as presented. Thank you very much. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. <clears throat> uh, item E, conduct a public hearing on the proposed Jersey Village Crime Control and Prevention District's budget for the fiscal year 2023-2024. I now call to order this public hearing on the City of Jersey Village Crime Control and Prevention District's proposed annual budget for fiscal year 2023-2024. Everyone desiring to speak at this hearing should complete a public hearing comment card and present the card to the city secretary. Each speaker will have five minutes to present information concerning the district's proposed fiscal year 2023-2024 budget. Uh, Chief of Police Kirk Riggs will summarize the subject of this public hearing. Mayor Council, you have in your, your packet, I'm just going to go over the revenue. Revenue brought in is $3 million. $15,000 and we're going to spend $3,015,000. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions, how we're spending it line by line if you need me to. <laughs> any questions or uh, discussion, or I guess just questions from council. I think at this time we're, we're really just in the public hearing though. Um, so uh, thank you, chief. I do appreciate it. Um, I do not currently have any, or at least I'm assuming that since the CCPD is not issuing any bonds, uh, that this public hearing comment card is meant for the regular council meeting. Uh, so I do not have any public comment cards about this particular public hearing. 
Uh, so therefore, we are going to move. Oh, hold on. Uh, there being no one desiring to speak, I now close this public hearing on the City of Jersey Village Crime Control and Prevention District's proposed annual budget for fiscal year 2023-2024. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, item F, consider resolution number 2023-01, adopting a budget for the ensuing fiscal year beginning October 1st, 2023 and ending September 30th, 2024, in accordance with Chapter 363 of the Texas Local Government Co Code and the alternate procedures adopted by the district and providing for the effective date thereof. Okay, so Lori, this does not require a call uh, of the, uh, does not require a, a roll call vote. Okay, great. So a uh, discussion amongst the directors on this item. The resolution correct is 2023-1? Correct. Yeah, I move we approve resolution 2023-1. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion amongst the directors? Seeing none, all of those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? The resolution passes. And so we are going to adjourn that meeting of the Crime Control and Prevention District. And we are going to move on to the Fire Control District. So I'm now going to call to order this uh, meeting of the Board of Directors of the Jersey Village Fire Control Prevention and Emergency Medical Services District. Uh, the date is July 17, 2023, and the time is currently 6.17 p.m. Uh, Madam Secretary, do we have a quorum of directors present? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, citizens comments any person who desires to address the city of jersey village fcp emsd board regarding an item on the agenda will be heard at this time in compliance with the texas open meetings act unless the subject matter of the comment is on the agenda the city staff and directors are not allowed to discuss the subject each person is limited to five minutes for comments to the board none of the comment cards that i have uh seem to be pertinent to the fire control district and so therefore uh we are going to move on in the agenda to item C, election and appointment of officers, president, vice president, and secretary for the term, which will begin July 18, 2023, and ending July 17, 2024. And I'm going to assume that this is substantially similar to the other uh, officer board discussions we've had previously. That is correct. Great. Mr. President, I'll uh, make the motion to appoint the same people as last year. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion amongst the directors? Uh, seeing none, all of those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Uh, that brings us to item D, consider approval of the minutes of the Fire Control Prevention and Emergency Medical Services District meeting held on November 21st, 2022. I move that we approve the minutes. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. That brings us to item E, conduct a public hearing on the proposed Jersey Village Fire Control Prevention and Emergency Medical Services District's budget for fiscal year 2023-2024. I now call to order this public hearing on the City of Jersey Village Fire Control Prevention and Emergency Medical Services District's proposed annual budget for fiscal year 2023-2024. Everyone desiring to speak at this hearing should complete a public hearing comment card and present the card to the City Secretary. Each speaker will have five minutes to present information concerning the district's proposed fiscal year 2023-2024 budget. Uh, Fire Chief Bits will summarize the subject of this public hearing. Board of Directors of the Fire Control and Emergency Service District. Uh, tonight we're presenting the 2023-2024 budget uh, for this coming year. Uh, the revenue is $2,835,000 with expenditures to be $2,834,999.50 with a surplus of 50 cents going back into the, to the fund. Have any questions? I'm here to answer. I'd like to know what your plan is for the 50 cents. Interest of 0 .001 cent. <laughs> Thank you. Those are the hard-hitting questions we expect. Okay. Uh, I do not have any comment cards for this particular public hearing. Uh, therefore, there being no one desiring to speak, I now close this public hearing on the Jersey Village Crime Control and Prevention District's adopted budget for the fiscal year 2023-2024.
We will now move on to item F, consider resolution number 2023-01, adopting a budget for the ensuing fiscal year beginning October 1st, 2023 and ending September 30th, 2024, in accordance with Chapter 344 of the Texas Local Government Code and the alternate procedures adopted by the district and providing for the effective date thereof. I think everyone's familiar with what we're discussing already. I just, before I move to... Um <clears throat> move to approve 2023-01. I wanted to speak to the audience and say we're not having much discussion on these as we addressed a lot of this in our budget meetings um, the other day, and they can be further up for discussion when it gets to the municipal budget. So I uh, just wanted to let people know that we're not just glancing over this. This has been seven hours of, of a lot of work, so thank you. And that was my motion. I move. Let's take it as a motion to approve. Motion to approve 23-01. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seven hours last Friday, but months and months of work prior to that. That is a very good point. Very good clarification. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? The resolution passes. And so we are going to adjourn that meeting and we are going to return to our city council. So we're going to resume the city council meeting. Uh, the time is now 6.22 p.m. Uh, and so that brings us to item D1 on the uh, agenda for the council meeting. Receive the adopted fiscal year 2023-2024 budget from the Jersey Village Crime Control and Prevention District. Uh, Lori Cootie, city secretary. Yes, so Mayor, this just uh, needs to have on the record that you have received the adopted budget from the district. Well, great. We have received uh, the proposed budget from the uh, Crime Control District. So then we will move on. I assume that it doesn't require a motion to receive it, correct? Okay. Uh, so that will bring it to item two, conduct a public hearing on the Jerseyville's Crime Control and Prevention District's budget for the fiscal year 2023-2024. Um, Lori, should I just use the same script as we used for before? No script. Hold on. Oh, referring back to the. Thank you. Uh, I now call to order this public hearing on the Jersey Village Crime Control and Prevention District's budget for the fiscal year 2023 2024. Everyone desiring to speak at this hearing should complete a public hearing comment card and present it to the City Secretary. The purpose of today's hearing is to give all interested parties the right to appear and be heard concerning the Jersey Village Crime Control and Prevention District's adopted budget for the fiscal year 2023 2024. Uh, I would invite Chief Riggs to uh, comment on this, but I'm going to assume that his comments will, I'm going to assume his comments will be substantially similar to those presented during the Crime Control and Prevention District's uh, public hearing. So, Chief, unless you had anything new to add, uh, we're just going to copy your comments from the uh, Crime Control Prevention District public hearing intro to this. Perfect. Okay. All right. Uh, I do not have any comment cards regarding this public hearing, and if you're wondering why are we having these public hearings, it's because the state told us to. So, I, not my choice. Uh, any, any, uh, I do not have any comment cards on this particular public hearing. So therefore, there being no one desiring to speak, I now close this public hearing on the Jersey Village Crime Control and Prevention District's adopted budget for the fiscal year 2023-2024. That brings us to item D3. Consider resolution number 2023-34, adopting the Jersey Village Crime Control and Prevention District's budget for fiscal year 2023-2024. I move that we approve resolution 2023-34. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Saying none, all those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? Uh, the resolution passes unanimously. That brings us to item E1. Receive the adopted fiscal year 2023-2024 budget from the Jersey Village Fire Control Prevention and Emergency Medical Services District. We uh, note that it has been received. So we will move on to item E2, conduct a public hearing on the Jersey Village Crime Control Prevention and Emergency Medical Services District's budget for the fiscal year 2023-2024. I now call to order this public hearing on the Jersey Village Fire Control Prevention and Emergency Medical Services District budget for the fiscal year 2023-2024. Everyone desiring to speak at this hearing should complete a public hearing comment card presented to the city secretary. The purpose of today's hearing is to give all interested parties the right to appear and be heard concerning the Jersey Village Fire Control Prevention and Emergency Medical Service District's adopted budget for the fiscal year 2023-2024. I would call Chief Bitts to speak, but I'm going to assume that his comments would be substantially similar to those presented for the public hearing during the district's board of directors meeting. 
And yes, sir, so man. therefore, um, I do not have any comment cards on this public hearing. And so therefore, there being no one desiring to speak, I now close this public hearing on the Jersey Village Fire Control Prevention and Emergency Medical Service District's adopted budget for the fiscal year 2023-2024. Which brings us to item E3, consider resolution number 2023-35, adopting the Jersey Village Fire Control Prevention and Emergency Medical Service District's budget for fiscal year 2023-2024. Do we approve resolution 2023-35? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? The resolution passes unanimously. That now brings us to item F1, conduct a public hearing on the City of Jersey Village Municipal Budget for fiscal year 2023-2024. I now call to order this public hearing on the City of Jersey Village proposed municipal budget for fiscal year 2023-2024. Everyone desiring to speak at this hearing should complete a public comment, public hearing comment card and present it to the City Secretary. The purpose of today's hearing is to give all interested parties the right to appear and be heard concerning the City of Jersey Village proposed municipal budget for the fiscal year 2023-2024. Uh, and Bruce, I assume since you have bond issue here, is this where you wanted to speak regarding that issue? This is a public hearing comment card you filled out. Yes, this is this is the city council budget uh, hearing. Bruce Bowden over on Lewis Street. One thing I want to ask you guys to do is, uh, first of all, because you're going to throw this big package of uh, bond issues at us in November, I guess it is. Uh, I'd like to find out what it would cost, and I know you guys love to spend money. I mean, <laughs> let's face it. Uh, but I'd like to see you guys get a bid to redo the pool as is, what it's going to cost. So the people have a comparison of what it costs to get it fixed up or to get it looking lovely or whatever you guys want to call it. But my point is, is unless you've got a basis to go from, my thing is I don't see a reason to improve it. It's okay. Do we need, you know, all the other stuff? I'm not sure. But uh, I can guarantee you $10 million or $6 million, whatever the number you guys choose on putting before us, is uh, going to be a lot more than just fixing the leak and new gun eye. So I'd like to see that. Uh, the other part I'd like to see is you guys break the bond issues into City of Jersey Village proper and ETJ. If it's a, if it's a water bond issue, what it takes to get the waters lines fixed here if it's sewer line what it takes in, in jersey village proper and then for the etj because according to the draft that you guys had a while back 18 million for sewer uh you were looking at out of 25 million so only 7 million was really needed for a city of jersey village proper as we you know currently employed i'd like to see it done that way let the people decide whether they want the ETJ, okay? I mean, if they're willing to pay the extra 10 cents on their budget, and you gotta remember, you guys got inflation on this too, because as houses go up at 10 cents, their base cost goes up. So you're probably looking at a 15%, if you look at it, you know, year on year, it's over 7% over the last seven uh, years. It's gone, your house valuation's gone up 7%, so you throw another 10 cents on top of that that you're asking for, people are going to end up, that's 15% versus 65, I guess it is. So you're looking at a pretty good size, chunk of change on people having to pay. It isn't just a flat fee, it's also the accumulative. So I'd like to see if you guys would break it up so people get a better understanding and make a much cleaner vote going forward. It may be more more paperwork, but it definitely makes it a lot cleaner. And that's really all I got to say. And actually, that's all I was going to say at the public uh, regular session, too. Great. Thank you. Um, Austin, just for point of clarification on this, do, do we have an approximate breakdown of how much of the current proposed bonds involve the ETJ directly? Yes, on uh, page 402 of the packet, uh, we've got kind of the breakdown of all the projects, the actual cost of it. Okay, great. We'll, we'll take a look at it. 
Okay, uh, I do not have any other cards uh, pertinent to uh, specifically the budget. Um, and so, oh, sorry. <clears throat> there being no one else desiring to speak, I now close this public hearing on the City of Jersey Village proposed municipal budget for the fiscal year 2023-2024. Uh, that now brings us to item F2, consider resolution number 2023-36, electing to postpone the final budget vote to the, on the 2023-2024 municipal budget until August 21st, 2023. Austin Blee, City Manager. Mayor and Councilors, uh, this just simply postpones our vote till next month. I move to approve resolution 2023-36. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? The resolution passes unanimously. Uh, that brings us to item F3. Consider resolution number 2023-37, setting the maximum proposed ad valorem tax rate, setting date for the public hearing on the tax increase, and setting the date City Council will adopt the fiscal year 2023-2024 ad valorem tax rate. Austin Bleece, City Manager. Mayor and Councilors, uh, this item here tonight uh, sets the maximum proposed tax rate. Um, this is what we utilize for all of our state required uh, notifications and everything. Uh, the maximum tax rate is based off of last year's property values. Uh, we do not anticipate adopting a final tax rate at the maximum. We do anticipate that being more closely uh, close to the uh, tax rate that the Council has historically set. Uh, but tonight we have to set the maximum, and that's what you're doing here. Thank you, Austin. And I think that bears repeating, so I'm going to go ahead and do it now. The maximum tax rate is not going to be the final tax rate. This is simply a requirement of state law. Uh, we're going to go through the process that they give us, and this is what it is. So uh, with that, discussion amongst counsel on this item. I move to approve resolution 2023-37. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, this does requ require a record vote. <clears throat> to approve resolution number 2023-37, setting the maximum proposed ad valorem tax rate, setting date for the public hearing on the tax increase, and setting the date for City Council will adopt the fiscal year 2023-2024 ad valorem tax rate. I will now call upon each council member by name to take the record vote. Once your name is called, answer I to signify your approval of the motion or nay to signify your disapproval. Council Member Wasson, state your vote. Aye. Councilmember Shepard, state your vote. Aye. Councilmember Mitchum, state your vote. Aye. Councilmember Singleton, state your vote. Aye. Councilmember McCray, state your vote. Aye. Okay. Uh, the motion carries unanimously. And so, therefore, we are now moving on to citizens' comments. Citizens who have signed a card and wish to speak to the City Council will be heard at this time in compliance with the Texas Open Meetings Act. Unless the subject matter of the comment is on the agenda, the City staff and City Council members are prevented from discussing the subject and may respond only with statements of factual information or existing policy. Citizens are limited to five minutes for their comments to the City Council. Uh, and I have a comment card from Bruce Bowden. Not really straight. I did understand that we had a problem with some video audio from June on the uh, where no one saw stuff, and I noticed that uh, that's happened before. Uh, two years ago, when I came up and talked, the audio didn't show up. Is there a problem with IT, or is it? Uh... Also, if you want to address that, there was an issue that night. It's it shouldn't be happening again. I mean, but was it resolved? So tonight will be recorded? You sure? And to be clear, Bruce, this, we, the, the incident you were talking about several years ago, we have since changed out the system that records okay. the Well, music. I know that. It was just the audio. <laughs> but uh, so you, you're positive it will show up tonight? Okay. All right. As long as we got people on it. But, you know, if, we got it, if it continues, you need to check with IT or get a better IT. All right. We appreciate the advice, Bruce. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, the last comment card I have is from Kimberly A. Now. My name is Kimberly A. Now, and I live at 15601 Singapore Lane. As my 22nd installment on Jersey Village, 1993 was so busy with changes that a continuation is needed as many citizens became involved in our local government's 
concerns for roads, new home and land developments, and public service awareness during the last half of the year. An open public hearing was called to discuss the West Gulf Bank Road expansion as Jersey Village was part of the second contract that was still planned for building the road out. Amongst the objections, some residents supported a retail-based tax source, ease the school traffic congestion, and keep through traffic out of the residential streets. There was a question by landowners of utilities being available for this area since its annexation in 1987. During the council meeting, it was advised that West Gulf Bank was planned to be a six lane road instead of the four lanes as originally assumed, so Mayor Descant changed his position. Although it was a unanimous vote to decline the road expansion, the county and or state had authority of eminent domain, so the citizens needed to be prepared if that action was to occur. Fire Chief Kathy Hutchins invited council to see the new display case in the lobby of City Hall as Councilman Wilson made a $1,000 donation to the fire department to have it built and display all types of memorabilia and decorations on the wall behind the case. Council members received a letter from Frank Marr advising that two policemen, officers Hart and Norris, aided the fire department fighting a fire and should be commended for their outstanding work and a copy of the letter placed in their personnel files. The city manager advised that the 100 club was to donate one K-9 and 24 human bulletproof vests worth almost $12,000 after Chief Lindsay and Sergeant Kelly met with the board to request funding for this equipment. Final plats were approved by unanimous votes for the Baptist Church on 20 acres, Wyndham Village for 113 single family lots on 40 acres, and Parks at Jersey Village for 80 patio homes on 16 acres. The mayor presented a proclamation to Tommy Benton an Eagle Scout and Troop 1177 for construct constructing a waste oil recycling bin for the citizens to use at City Hall. An open joint public hearing for the rezoning of empty land on Philippine at Ecuador brought many opinions as the landowner was approving of the change to commercial for an animal hospital, hospital to be built. In December, the Chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission submitted the final report of recommendations for usage of this land, such as for townhomes, a public park, or community buildings, but usage was not to be considered obnoxious or offensive. To review, the constraints of budgets, county and state laws, and citizen participation is important to understand as our public officials cannot just do whatever they nor the citizens want. Working together to follow the rules set forth and educating others on procedures can ease confusion and misinformation. It is everyone's responsibility to adhere to best practices and ask questions for clarification to sources that have the answers, such as the Municipal Code website, municode.com, by searching Jersey Village to read our ordinances library. Almost all, of the, almost all of the city government meetings are open to the public. Last Friday, July 14th, was the 2023-24 budget work session, and only one resident was there to observe the discussion. Maybe Jersey Cow ice cream should be offered to get citizens to attend these meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly, and thank you for being that one citizen who was there to observe the meeting. Okay, uh, that is all I have for citizen comments. So that brings us to the city manager's report. Austin, please. Mayor and Councilors, the report is in front of you. If there's any questions, we're happy to answer those. I do want to highlight two quick things. One, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, Easy Fiber and their work in the city and the, in the city right away. Uh, the city cannot regulate utility companies, telecommunication companies like that, but we can regulate how they work in the city right-of-ways, and uh, they, their permit has been pulled. They will have to go through that permitting process again, and we will make sure that we've got uh, additional things in their next permit as well uh, to the extent that we can. The other one, um, on Friday, the U.S. House Representatives uh, Appropriations Committee posted information 
that the White Oak Bayou Wastewater Treatment Plant, which Jersey Village is um, about 46% owner of, will receive a million dollars in congressionally funded spending towards the projects that are necessary there. So it's great news for uh, for Jersey Village in the area, and uh, we're excited that we were able to work with uh, Congressman Hunt's office to, in order to make that happen. Great. Thank you, Austin. Uh, questions from council? Uh, the only thing I did uh, want to ask about, Austin, I noticed uh, the golf course uh, finances. As of right now, the revenues exceed the uh, expenditures by about a little over 20000 I guess. Uh, do we anticipate uh, that, that the um, – I know we have a budgeted uh, item for um, uh, transfer from the general fund. Are we expecting that we'll need that? At this point, we think we're on pace for uh, not needing a transfer from the general fund this year. Very good news. Very good news. Well, congrats to the golf course staff for all the hard work they put into uh, to making that place uh, cash flow positive on an operational basis. Uh, okay. Unless any other council members had any questions or comments on the city manager's report, we will move on. Uh, which brings us to the consent agenda. We've got one item on the consent agenda. Does anyone dare to pull it off? I move to approve the consent agenda. A second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all of those in favor? All of those against? Any abstentions? The motion passes, which brings us to the regular agenda. Uh, first item on the regular agenda, discuss and take appropriate action concerning a potential bond election in November of 2023 for water and sewer improvements, street improvements, a new pool and bathhouse and park improvements. Robert Bassford, Assistant City Manager. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this item is uh, a continuation from last council meeting. Um, what I did is I took the information from our last council packet and I added uh, additional developments in boldface. Um, staff continued collecting stakeholder input regarding the pool, uh, the potential concept of what a new pool could look like. We collected data via survey, advertised online as well as in person. Um, as of July 10th, we received 182 responses and staff utilized this feedback to formulate one pool concept so that way we can begin to finalize uh, opinion of probable cause. Cost, sorry. This concept took a few features from each of the original three that were presented. That pool concept has been attached as Exhibit A. Uh, this concept can still, of course, be modified, but it has been used as a template for our overall pool budget. The opinion of probable cause for the, in, for the concept provided was also included with Exhibit A. Initial research narrowed down the pool project into a handful of subsections with not to exceed estimates for each. Our consultant feels confident with these and will continue to specify and refine these not to exceeds uh, for a more refined budget over the next few weeks. The rendering will be transformed into a color rendering with more details specified as well. The initial opinion of probable cost data indicates the bond amount needed for the desired improvements comes in at roughly $9 million as opposed to the initial $11 million forecast in June. Staff will continue to gather more stakeholder input and would allow for additional, that would allow for additional refinement to the project list as well as the opinion of probable cost. Okay. Concurrent with the, uh, pools, the pool, the staff also gathered stakeholder input for the park. Um, as of July 9th, we received 145 responses to that survey. The concept has been attached as Exhibit B and the opinion of probable cost with a high-end option as well as a low-end option has been attached as Exhibit C. The initial data indicates that the bond amount needed for all of the desired improvements listed on the schematic site plan comes in at $9.9 .9 million as opposed to the initial $8 million forecasted in June. Staff will continue to gather more stakeholder input that would allow for additional refinement to the desired project list as well as the opinion of probable cost. Both of those surveys are still open and active. I believe as of today we are up to 231 responses for the pool and 185 responses for the park. Pertaining to the street improvements, Council also may want to consider a full traffic bridge on Ecuador to alleviate traffic congestion through the neighborhood rather than just the pedestrian bridge. Since the May budget meeting, staff has spoken with engineers about the pedestrian bridge at Ecuador. We put in a $2.4 million placeholder for the bridge, and the engineers believe that that amount would adequate for a full vehicle bridge with sidewalks to be installed over the bayou if desired. This would reduce the amount of traffic through the residential streets and could ease the school traffic flows. 
while counsel does not have to decide definitively tonight about having a full bridge or not, it would be helpful to know if counsel wants to include that full amount in the bond. Moving on to water and sewer improvements. Uh, it is important to note, I wanted to answer a question from a previous counsel. Um, the linear footage factors in all of the documented rehab projects conducted in the last 20 years. So we did take into account any renovations made to our infrastructures in the last 20 years. Um, the White Oak Bio Joint Powers Board manages one of our main wastewater treatment plants. Their portion, their, that portion of the CIP renovation is $6 million. And then the water and sewer additions to the ETJ are estimated to cost $6.15 million. And the only additional update that I have was I mentioned that it's important to note that these improvements would also potentially affect operating budgets in the Parks and Recreation Division to factor in additional pool hours, lifeguard staffs, pool chemicals, park maintenance, park light utilities, etc. I added um, some research on this. Some operational impacts we could see are as follows. Um, additional lifeguard staff, we could see an annual increase to be roughly 190%. Um, you usually move from seven guards to 12 in the pool house. Um, pool chemicals, you're looking at an increase of 175%. If a pool heater is selected, that comes with minimal costs. However, you could see a natural gas increase. Um, colder months could come with an $8,000 natural gas bill. Additional utilities to light the park. This could offset. This could be offset with a, t a potential minus service charge to rent the fields for lights. Um, some park districts usually have a fee to use the light portion if they rent the field. And it is important to note that these estimated were formulated based on our current pool season. If we were to change the pool season, the parameters just mentioned would change a little bit as well. We do need guidance from council this evening on how many bond questions the council would like to see. The water and sewer bond will be one proposition at $15.8 million. The street and bridge will be a second proposition at $18 million. The pool and park items could be one proposition together for a total amount of $19 million, or it can be split up into two separate propositions. Based on the information presented this evening, staff recommends that the pool and park be one proposition. There are a lot of overlap between the two projects for electrical, utilities, and site work. Having it be one proposition makes sense in that regard. If council would like to see two separate propositions on, staff would recommend each proposition be $9.5 million. And then the recommended council action would, can you please provide direction on how many bond propositions they would like to see and nor form a vote is necessary. Okay, yeah. uh, discussion amongst council on this item. I, I agree with you um, that the sister projects make the most sense together for just the way they intertwine together. It doesn't really make sense for to do one without the other. You're talking park and pool. Park and pool. I, I think there's enough synergies there that it makes more sense to do them together as, as opposed to doing them separately. Well, I'd, I'd agree with that. Um, Putting them together, I, I would be curious about the, um, like the complete, I guess more of like the complete and total scope. Uh, one thing I didn't see on here was a timeline associated with it. And if it's in there, I there's a good chance I missed it. No concrete timeline as of now. Um, we would try to start construction at the end of next pool season and complete it before the following pool season so we don't lose any operation. Would that just be pool, or would also there be some of the park stuff done at the same time, or is this one, then the other, then the other? In an ideal scenario, you would close the pool and the park and complete them all at the same time. Thank you. Well, it sounds like there's already a majority for keeping them together, but I don't think it's a f fair representation of the question. Uh, yes pool and the park both have synergy but the pool is at a far greater need uh, incomparable need to park improvements and while I would love to see the park improvements I think it is fair to keep them separate because of the immense need of the pool the staff is showing a like $500 difference in synergy here um, they're asking for 19 million for both of them 
or 9.5 million for each one separately. There's barely any savings there. <clears throat> and if both of them pass, then we can still do both of them and take advantage of the cost savings, and we wouldn't have to spend the whole amount. But if we're... If citizens find that it doesn't justify the $10 million for wants to improve Clark Henry and pull that bond, then we can still do the pool that we need to do. Instead, we're asking them to bite $20 million, $19 million, to be fair, for the whole shebang. And there is no reason for us to vote to keep both of those unless we're trying to tie the want to something they, we know they're going to vote for. I'm with you, James. I, I, uh, anecdotally, uh, most of the people I've talked to, if not all, they're concerned about the pool price, but they're pro-pool. And the parks, they can't say they're against city parks or even against the improvements, but they're hesitant to, on, on that amount now that said i'm i'm pro both but i think it's it's best to consider them as separate items um if it doesn't at the end of the day i, I think they'll both pass but i think it's fair to to have them both se considered separately can we get some input maybe robert other than the like the, i see the price being what that is but what would the advantage be to having it both lumped in together versus split out i think just like you said with the utilities so for the pool and the park we're going to have to reroute some sanitary um the electrical grid we're going to have to increase the uh, electrical capacity of the park um how do you define you know how much of that goes to the pool whereas how much of that goes to the park um to light the park as well as to power the pool you're going to need additional electricity so there's just some synergy things there in terms of site work and, and so on and so forth um you know, the site work around the pool while it, it's under construction. So that's kind of what we were referencing with those. There are some overlapping scope for each. Um, if you do the pool, you're, you're still going to have to do the electrical upgrades. You're still going to have to do the sanitary. If you do the park and only the park, you're going to have to do the electrical and you're going to have to do the sanitary. So I need a quick clarification. Justin may be able to provide this. Um, so if, if we were to separate out the parks improvements from the pool improvements and they both passed, uh, would, uh, I assume that the funds in each one, the funds allocated to each would be locked to those purposes. Yeah, so so th that's the difference when you do a bond. I mean, your bond council will speak more to how, how they craft that language, but the, but generally it's, if, if you have one item that like say in this case, you have one item combined things, then, then whatever's in the scope of how that item's worded for the voters, assume they approve it. You can do anything within that scope. If you separate it out, then my, uh, assumption would be that there would be some distinctions between the two projects. If both were approved and say you have I mean, again, nine and a half million approved for each, one project went to ten, you would be limited to nine and a half for that specific project and you wouldn't be able to borrow from one fund to put to the other one. So that would be the advantage of, of doing combo in case you wanted some freedom to move, but it would be clear from the voters which one, which proposition would pass. If both wanted to be passed then the voters would show that. If one was not favorable then you'd be able to see. Yeah, I, I will say I, I I definitely agree with the principle involved in giving voters as much discrete option as possible, uh, because I, I do think that there probably are, there, there are probably quite a few people that feel very strongly about one and maybe wait and see about the other one, uh, or maybe very strongly about one and don't or oppose the other. Um, but there is a concern that, especially with something that closely tied together, that if you if you silo the money completely. Uh, you do run the danger if there are some cost overruns in one area and maybe you didn't need to use all of the funds in another, you're not going to be able to move that back and forth, even if they both passed. Uh, so that, that would be my major concern. But it's not like we're talking about a pool in a street. We're talking yeah, about yeah. a pool in a park, and the bond is going to be generically written enough that you're going to be able to do things with the money and make it be able to move from project to project it is not locking i don't in i part. don't think that's actually correct when it comes to bond stuff it actually I, from what i've read on it when especially that feedback we got that were just more of generic street questions stuff that comes into one like it is 
within that account, it has to go to those specifically written stuff. It's just like the educational bonds. It has to go to whatever school it's listed at. It can't be moved over from one high school to a audiovisual performance building that has to be specifically for that project. Yes, but we're talking about a pool and a park. And you're talking about electrical facilities and sanitary that have to be done for both of those. It would not be hard to be able to make those projects apply for both of these proposals. They are not that far apart. Again, it's, it's really going to be dependent on what the, the language of the proposal is going to be. And so it's, it's going to be in how it's drafted. There's not, I mean, there's some specific requirements. It's got to be specific enough that a voter understands what they're voting for. But that, but that proposition language can be written broadly, and a lot, and a lot are. Street maintenance is one of them. Um, you know, you'll see bond propositions a lot of time for street maintenance that's extremely general, and so it allows cities to have a lot of freedom to do something within that, within that realm. Park, parks are the same kind of way. So it's really, it's really going to depend on what that bond language is going to be. So, Justin, hypothetically, if we were to write them very broadly, I'm not saying that we should do this, but I'm just throwing this out there kind of as devil's, devil's advocate. If we wrote it broadly enough to where money in the pool fund could be used for parks and money in the parks fund could be used for the pools, let's say the pool passes and the parks don't, and the pool runs significantly under budget, does that mean now we can turn around and take the remainder of those funds and, and now do some of the improvements in the park that maybe voters had just voted down? Well, I, I, think what you, I don't think you can put in a proposition, you know, the ability to move you know, funds around. So it just, it's going to depend, again, on what the project is described as in the bond proposal itself. So that's, so it's, again, it's just, I know it's not a good answer right now, but it's going to depend on whatever that language is. I, I guess my point being that if the goal is to give citizens an option to have their voice heard regarding one project versus the other, but then it gets written in such a way that it can be moved back and forth, I think it tends to undermine, it, it, it creates the illusion of having distinct choices. Well, and I'm not saying we would do that. I'm just saying that, that some may seize upon that. Well, something that came to mind is if you wrote both independent, like if you did the park without thinking that the pool passes, you'd have overlap, and it, I don't know what the cost would be if it's an extra $250,000, which is not a small sum of money. I recognize that. But then you, nothing says if both pass, you have to spend that or even go out for bonds. That would be your maximum bond set. And then you could find the synergies in between as long as it's properly worded that way. Maybe the pool pays for the park sanitary if there's overlap and there's dual use. I, I, I don't know. I, I think the principle of separate votes outweighs some convenience to that degree. Yeah, and my worry is not about things like the, the infrastructure because I think that's the easy that's the easy stuff to justify. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm more concerned about, particularly in the environment we're in, where costs are not necessarily easy to pin down when we're talking about going all the way through a bond process and then getting it approved and then going to market with the bonds and then going out to bid and then contracting. You could have a lot that changes in the meantime. Uh, I know we're trying to... You know, people have asked why it's so dang expensive. Well, because you have to estimate, assuming that prices are going to continue to go crazy. Um, I just, I would agree when we're talking about streets and sewer and things of that nature being separate. Those are obviously very, very separate things. I feel like this is less of a, a separate type item. And if we could, if if it were possible to do it without having that risk, I'd be all for it. Um, I just think putting putting them together gives you more flexibility. Of I, I understand that you're saying we could take each one and add more money, but then I think adding on another half a million optically is still not it, that doesn't make sense to me. I do think they'll both pass independently. Um, I'm not on swim team, so I don't have a lot of the pool group, but I have a lot of parks the moms group and I'm like I know that in like in the comprehensive plan this this is ready the city's ready for this so um I think putting them together to give us more flexibility and they're to make sure they're done at the same time these moms don't want construction you know happening in different times they want it done at, at this time so if it doesn't pass this time it'll pass next time and then you're two times out of the park 
you know, um, I just think it's the smartest financially to put them together. Um, I think the people have spoken loudly about the comprehensive plan and, and the need for parks improvement. And I think the pool was just an unexpected issue that came up that people are also like, yep, I, I understand we have to fix that. That, that sweet pool was 50 years old and it, it, did, it lived a good life. Interesting that everyone thinks both are going to pass, but we're not going to separate them. I think because it's ultimately not about, it's not about trying to tie one to the other. It's about ensuring that when it comes time to go ahead and make use of the money that we have the greatest flexibility available. Um, frankly, I think they're both going to pass either way. So that, that, has, that doesn't factor at all into my thinking on it. If that were the only factor, I would say go ahead, break it up into as many pieces as you can. I think um, from the conversations I've had with people, I think the like the biggest positives I've heard were about the eight lanes in the pool. That these that uh, that section of the pool with it being heated seems to be a very positive. That I've from personal feedback from people that have spoken to me, the biggest drawback um, or the biggest thing that I think pe I've I've heard expressions of people being concerned about was the skate park and the secondary what looks like to be that secondary bridge or walkway to it. Um, and so I think for me, like, if I have to say that's of the stuff I've heard, like at all, those would be the two, like the most positive things I've heard. And then what if for lack of a different word, what would say the negative would have been the skate park. And I don't, it wasn't even more of that. We didn't need a skate park. I, I think it was more, it came across as, oh my God, that's a lot all at once kind of a thing, which I, I also agree. Cause when I first started looking at this, it was kind of like, whoa. Yeah. I think it's important for folks to know that this is not. We, we, we're not discussing this assuming that everything that has been put out there is a done deal. We're, that's, that's a whole separate discussion. Uh, the reason why we're having this discussion now is because we have certain deadlines that have to be met in order to get on the ballot. There's still plenty of time to discuss what stays, what goes within, within the realm of what we're, we're, we're doing. Um, in fact, we just yeah we we just got in our packet all of the information regarding the survey, and there are some pretty pretty strong opinions, particularly on the skate park. That seems to be the one that people really they either really liked it or they really didn't like it, and there weren't very many people in the middle. Whereas that was not the case with every other issue. Every other issue, people were, were had varied opinions. Um, but but keep in mind that when we put together this proposal to go on the ballot, that that dollar amount is the maximum amount of bonds that we would potentially go out to market with it doesn't mean we have to spend all of that money it doesn't mean we have to sell all of those bonds the vote is just to authorize us to be able to go up to that number so it could be that when it all comes down to it and we put together this project and it goes out to bid maybe we find out that it's a lower price and uh we we um you know we we wind up not having to go to market with all of those bonds which would be a great thing um so this is this is just to kind of figure out some of the things that we some of the questions we have to answer now as we get ready to put together these bond propositions. Any any further discussion or questions from council? Uh, does staff have all of the a clear enough? Uh, yes, sir. Where sense you, of uh, direction. I think we know which way we need to go. Okay, great. All right. Um, there was no other action requested of us on this item so unless there's any further input did, um did we need to know about the the bridge whether or not we wanted that to be pedestrian and road motor vehicle this is the bridge over ecuador correct i mean at first thought i'd like to see it a road because of the conversation that we had around Congo and the need to reduce the traffic on Congo or widen Congo, which at the end of the day will be just as much cost associated with it. So that's my first impression, but I'm sure after moving it to a street to reduce the traffic through has anybody gotten traffic? any kind of feedback on that 
I don't know if we've known about this possibility. It was very. Br- it was briefly discussed during while we were discussing the bonds, uh, but I don't know that we've spent a tremendous amount of time on that question. Uh, do we know? Do we have an approximate estimation as to what it would add to the cost to to make it a street instead of pedestrian? So that that cost that's in there would add it. I mean, would cover it at two point four. Um, so I mean, right now, if council, I mean, it goes back to the same topic as the pool. You know, if the council could put that out there, and the council at a later point in time could choose not to do a full street one and just do a pedestrian bridge, um, I don't think that we, you know, definitively have to narrow that decision today either. But it just it would impact how the project would move forward at at some later date. I mean, I assume the idea is it's either either we replace the existing pedestrian bridge or we build a street bridge. So. I see 2.4 million that would be enough for a vehicle bridge, but if we just wanted to replace the pedestrian bridge with a new one, do we know what the cost of that would be? About 400,000. So we're talking about a $2 million difference? That's pretty huge. And have we contemplated the traffic impact? Or have we even... Where exactly is that the one where you would come down Philippine and it would go Ecuador would just go straight all the way over? Oh, I think I'm trying to think of how that would pack the elementary school because they come only they make it one way in and one way out for easy flow, but that would kind of be counterintuitive too. Well, it'd alleviate it off of Congo because they'd have to pull it in over there. I'm just trying to think like. But there goes a safe way to get over there on your bicycle from that side of town. I mean, it wouldn't even affect me. This isn't just about me, I promise. <laughs> My kids are too old. But, you know, I, I, there's a lot of kids that use that um, pedestrian bridge to walk or ride their bikes. I think this, pro- this particular one probably needs a little bit more thought and conversation before we make a... I, if, if that's the way council wants to go, my thought would be to leave all options on the table at the moment and let's narrow it down as, as we go. If council decides to put this out all out for bond and if the voters approve it, council still does not have to do a full-fledged bridge at that point. We can definitely study and discuss it more as we go. But right now this would still give the council the, the greatest number of options versus taking it out right now. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. Okay. We, we would want to that's, do a lot that's more. Fine. That's fine. Yeah, we, we would definitely, before we make a decision along these lines, we would need to do a lot more research on, because I'm just thinking of the impact of people coming in from the Beltway and trying to make a left turn onto Ecuador and backing up all of that traffic into that intersection of the Beltway. But anyway, that that's obviously a, a discussion. I'd gonna... prefer it to be out on the Beltway than down Philippine around my house. <laughs> See, it yeah. goes, from, goes from one person's street to another person's street, so... It's it's all these are the things we have to sort through before we make that decision. So um, so I assume is everyone okay with just leaving it there for now, understanding that that's just just in case. Yeah. Okay. Is that all y'all needed from us on this item? I think we're good. Okay. Good deal. And and again, if anyone has any questions about this, something that that maybe a question that came up in your mind that you you would like to discuss further by all means do feel free to contact all of us uh we're more than happy to discuss this uh probably with details you rather would not don't need um but uh always happy to have that discussion so we're going to go ahead and move on to um item two consider resolution 2023-16 amending the code of ordinances of the city of jersey village at chapter 10 animals article one in general by adding a new section 10-6 keeping harboring and owning chickens providing a severability clause providing for repeal providing a penalty as as provided by section 1-8 of the code and providing an effective date michelle mitchum mayor pro tem hello everyone chickens it's always a, a fun topic here um, however, Texas um, recently passed HB 2127 um, to go in effect September 1. Um, and from what I understand, it could prohibit ordinances um, similar to ours that would restrict chickens. Um, and I know that they were, from what I understand, they were trying to regulate more of the city of Houston, but it also kind of trickles down to us. So um, we've done this in the past when the Texas state passed 
a law that we got in front of it and passed our own ordinance so then we had a say and and like they're coming whether we like it or not so let's have a say in how we want this to look and to protect the integrity and um you know our community so i asked austin to please put this on the agenda just so it can be an open discussion and that we could get in front of it okay discussion amongst council on this item Quick, quick question for for Justin. Cause I, one, thank you, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, for putting this out there. I think um, it's it's wise to be prepared for uh, <clears throat> the the onslaught of. There's three House bills. It, it's mentioned in the the packet: twenty one, twenty seven, seventeen fifty, and twenty three oh eight. And even our legislators don't know exactly what it's meant to do. So what we're looking for is probably a whole bunch of lawsuits of citizens against cities, cities against the state, and other things before all things are um, recognized uh, as what this actually means for, for us. So uh, I guess my question to Justin is, do you have any sense of a timeline when – things like this happen when things finally get sorted out? So the, o- the only thing that anybody knows right now about, it looks about 2127, so it's, in case everybody's there, it's House Bill 2127, and, you know, there's a lot of, you know, some rumors about why it was started and all that and what city or issue was supposed to affect. But the way the bill got passed was that essentially, and it's, it, 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 it's I mean, I don't think it's a stretch to say it targets home rule cities, this this rule, but essentially says that, you know, the bill provides, I think, not eight or nine what they call fields. And what it says is if the state legislature has occupied, and it doesn't define that, occupied one of those fields, then any other rule that especially a home rule city has adopted, you are preempted from that rule, and the state rule will apply. So in Texas, there's, I mean, you've got home rule cities, you've got general law cities. General law cities, that is how they run anyway. Cities that don't have a charter. You do have a charter. You're a homeless city. Other cities in Texas, they have to look for the st- any kind of state code have authority to make a rule. And that's generally been very broad. And so that's, you know, again, a lot of deference to, to people to rule themselves. Here, though, what's interesting is that it's, it, this seems to target home rule authority to make, to make ordinances. And so even though the question here is about, about chickens, it's really the, the, way that co- the way that bill is written, it's ex- way, way more broad than that. I mean, some of the big ones that are there, it, it says that, again, n- there's no definition of what it means to be occupied, but the real property code. So anything, essentially, you can interpret that to mean anything that the state has done regarding real property, you can't make any kind of ordinance related to that. Occupations code. Anything that the state has done inside the occupations code, you can't do anything in, in contradiction to that. Um, and, again, it's, it, it, we, no one knows at this point what the scope is, if that means that, if you have a rule that's very specific that's in conflict with something that the state has occupied, is it that specific rule or is it the fact that the state has spoken into something in the occupations code, then you can have no rule outside, you know, that would be affected with the occupations code, if that makes sense. No one knows how broad or narrow this is yet. It's already been that specific bill. The city of Houston has filed a lawsuit against it. I'm sure more cities are going to join in on that. Um, But how that answers your question, the only thing we know is that September 1st it goes into effect and what it does allow is that it, it allows any kind of citizen, um, it gives them standing to file a lawsuit against the, against the city on any kind of rule that they would feel would be in violation of this bill. It allows, I mean, it's not an immediate lawsuit. It's a 90-day period where the city and the, and the complainant, whether that's a single individual or a group of people, allows them to work together to address the issue that would be raised by the, by the resident. And then if there's no, you know, if there's no resolution to that, that's when a lawsuit can be filed. Um, but so despite the fact that cities right now are already taking action to get, the, get you know, temporary injunctions on the enforcement of that September 1 date, if, if, it's, if that's passed, if those don't come to fruition, then I imagine we'll see some lawsuits like that. Maybe, I don't expect that here, but in other cities we'll see that and we'll start learning what the scope of this bill does. So that so that's that's the big one, the 2127. That's just that's way more broad than just animals. That's, that's a lot of issues. Um, I mean, just for instance, one today I was dealing with is you know zoning. There's uh, in another city that that our firm represents. There's 
my common, you know, that we have manufactured homes are addressed in zoning. There's, there's some rules associated with that. When you start looking at manufactured homes, that even in, even in how they're defined under the zoning authorization in the code, it mentions the occupations code and mentions the real property code. So you could theoretically say that someone could say that House Bill 2127 prohibits zoning related to manufactured homes. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, because we have to wait and see what you know, lawsuit is, is applied to a city that tries to enforce that. So I'll have to say, that's, that's a big one, and the answer is I don't know. We know it goes into effect September 1, and we'll just see. The, I think more specifically in the background information, the other two bills there, 1750 and 2308, are more specific to agricultural operations. The big thing on that is that um, on, on 1750, I mean, there's a process now to adopt regulations related to what's going to be called agricultural operations. That's been expanded in a sense. Essentially, you have to adopt a resolution. But before you can even do that, you have to get Texas A&M Ag, Ag Life, or I can't remember their name, but they have, they, they have to have, they're going to have a paper and research that's going to say what kind of impact these agricultural operations have. Poultry is one of those. Livestock is one of those. So, I mean, theoretically what it could do is um, what we would call in your zoning ordinance, like most, you have residential lots. This would call those agricultural lots. And so, and then, and it, it, depending on the impact that's found by your own, you know, by your research or the Texas A&M agricultural research, it could be found that these things, again, so here, unless there's a, like a severe negative impact of chickens, that those would be a preempted, you know, use on the property. And so, anyway, I'll have to say that there's a lot of questions. There's almost no answers. And so none of these go into effect to September 1. So even if you were to adopt that now, I think that all these would look back at the, the, at the regulations now, at least 2127, someone could speak into that and say that, you know, that you're preempted from the ag agricultural code, which is one of the codes mentioned in 2127. So if it's determined that chickens are, you know, if, and occupied by the state in a field of agriculture, then you would be preempted from having any regulation, and I think that would be retroactive. And so the same thing with the other two, depending on, if, even if you were to say that you were not preempted from the other one, these other two provide a step in the process for how to adopt regulations related to chickens. Would that mean, and I don't mean to hog the mic, but would that mean that for chickens, or because that's the topic at hand, if, if we were to adopt that, we could not adopt regulations on volume or, or how to housing or anything of that nature? It would just be a... <laughs> Yeah, so it depends. I mean, again, it depends. And again, we're theoretical now, so right. I don't know. But, but, the, but the, how I think it could be done under 2127, the answer to that question could be that, yeah, you're completely, one way to look at it, you could be completely preempted. And so there's, it doesn't matter what you set because you're, you're, you can't do it if the state has already stepped in and done. The issue here, though, is they haven't said anything related to chickens, so I don't know, are, are you preempted or not? And that's, that's a big question. If it's determined... And I don't want to be too nerdy, you know, here attorney-wise, but if it's determined that you're not preempted, that, yes, the state has an agricultural code, and that's one of those that they could say we're field preemption, but if it's narrowed and not that broad, and it's determined that, you know, in order for the state to have taken action in a field, they have to take some specific action, like related to poultry or livestock or whatever, however they would define that, and it's determined that we don't have any rules regarding chickens, then that would mean you're not preempted, and then I think these next two bills is, is where, where you would find your rule, you know, your rule how to do that, and it's to go through this adoption process where you adopt a resolution, but before that, you have to get either health code officer or some kind of consultant that's going to determine the impact that this particular use would have. So in this case, your six, five chickens, whatever it would be, the impact on a nuisance level and some other issues that it would have. Then you base your resolution on that, and then, you know, depending on your whatever rules you have, Texas A&M, again, is going to produce this, you know, more broad kind of regu regulations re regarding livestock and poultry. And then if, as long as you're in conformance with that, then you can have the regulation. And that's what it seems like to me now. And, again, that's, that's the most clear I can be. I don't like chickens. So <laughs> there's a lot of legal smoke involved here, to be honest. Um, I think it's probably a little early to be determining what the law says it doesn't talk about chickens it talks about agricultural code the other two talk very specifically about agricultural code they do mention poultry and there was a 
lively discussion in 2020 about whether or not we should call it chicken or poultry. Um, poultry includes turkeys, geese, ducks. So, you know, if this, whole, if this all goes the way that we're thinking it may, then we're going to get to live next to geese. And my dogs. But I think there's way like too much smoke to any take any action. I guess, uh, like my, my uh, <laughs> I didn't want to live in the country, so I chose to live in a neighborhood, well, like a city, an actual city, um, and I just, not a big fan of chickens, um, I know some people really are, and I just don't know, um, to me, all this stuff that's coming out right now, it seems very uh, ambiguous, unless anyone else understood what he was talking about. Um, but I just, I don't necessarily know that there's any reason to do anything yet, especially if it's, at some point, if it's not going to matter. Well, I think the key here is the, this bill doesn't go, at least specifically talking about House Bill 2127, doesn't go into effect until September. Uh, so we do have some time. Uh, also, we don't have anyone threatening litigation against us on September 1st. So we have even a little bit more time after that. Um, I have often s sat up here and warned about the, you know, folks in the legislature coming in and saying, you know, eroding further ability to self-govern. And this is the biggest one yet. I mean, it, it, I, going back and rereading the, 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 this bill, I'll admit I have a hard time wrapping my brain around it. Um, to, you know, to have an ordinance that regulating conduct in a field of regulation that is occupied by a provision of this code, that, to me, doesn't even say that it has to be something that is explicitly written into the, the agriculture code, for example, because we're already prohibited, as a, even as a home rule city, from passing an ordinance that goes against an express provision of state law. This feels like it goes further, which is basically to say, okay, agriculture code is one of the items that's listed there. Uh, all cities are now prohibited from passing an ordinance that regulates conduct in the field of agriculture, is the way I read this. <laughs> it either, either, yeah, either, either this is uh, an effort by someone to completely eliminate home rule cities, because in essence, because it also does say that that if there is a rule or if there, if there is some other statute that expressly provides you the ability to pass an ordinance of that type, then you can do it even if it's in this field. That's a general law city. You know, if, if you're 300 people large, great. <laughs> if you've got 8,000 people or more, you know, the, the whole, you know, the, the history of this state has been tied to the idea that larger areas should be given some amount of self-governance. Um, you know, I believe somebody that lives three blocks away from me has a better idea as to what Jersey Village needs as opposed to somebody that lives 800 miles away from me. Um, Am I the only person that finds it really interesting how historically Texas has been so opposed of any type of national government and versus state government, and we seem to be doing a lot of that to our own citizens? It, it's not lost on me at all. Um, it's 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 problematic because uh, yeah, legally there's a distinction, but in principle it's not. Um, so at the end of the day, though, we we do have to wait and see, I think we do have to wait and see how this shakes out. I do think it's a little premature to pass this regulation at this point. If we have active litigation that could um, clarify some of this, so there's there's irony. Um, some some we've reached out to our state rep and the feedback who was a co-author of this bill and the feedback was we can't tell you what's in this bill we normally refer to the eight attorney general but the attorney general can't tell you what's in this bill because they're being sued because of this bill so nobody knows or nobody wants to say and that's really frustrating um and i agree with you mayor and and i wasn't Council. really expecting um it to pass to be honest but I did want at least the discussion that we were aware that something was coming in September and that it was just not um, overlooked. 
I think that um, Jersey Village has a lot of uh, backyard pigeons already hanging out, doing their thing, and um, it's been okay. Um, I just wanted to get in front of if something was going to pass, like plant the seed of what we wanted things to look like and you know because if we did do an ordinance like this and then people started to build uh, build the coops according to what we wanted and then texas was like you know yolo you can do whatever you want then at least they already built what we wanted they're not going you know that that was my two cents but i'm okay with just tabling this and just having that little seed and i agree i don't think that anybody's going to be suing us over it yeah. I, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say I was highly traumatized by my grandmother's chickens Aww. as a kid, so I really don't like them. <laughs> Have you ever met a non-shifty looking chicken? They look sideways out of their eyes, guys, like lizards. Apparently, they're Jen, descendants of favorite. the T-Rex. If that's yeah. they are like. I rest my case. Oh, this aside, I am pro chicken, so there's at least two of us here. Okay, okay. So um, I will move to table the discussion on uh, agenda item J two. Take no action. Well, we take yeah, you wonder we just don't have to take any action because okay. if you put it on the table, then take it off the table, all of that—it's a mess. Sorry, um, I said the wrong words. Just one real quick thing that I will say though is, and I think this was mentioned somewhat earlier, but I do want to emphasize this. Uh, the, the thinking here, though, is correct that if it turns out, and I hope it's not the case, but if it turns out that we basically lose, because then we're not even talking about chickens anymore, we may be talking about cattle, goats, who knows. Um, if it turns out that the state has taken away our ability to be able to prohibit someone from having agriculture in their yard, we do, there, there will come a point where we will need to get creative uh, in how, what, what do we have the ability to still do uh, so it, it's, yes, it, it, but it may be more complicated than just simply saying, if you're going to have them here, you have to do these things, because that's still agriculture related. Like you were mentioning, I think health and, health and safety aspects probably are. So, so even if 2127 were to come and say, you know, you're, you're preempted, you can't do anything that, without, you know, that we've already occupied as a state, then I think the other two bills would speak to this, because then they would have occupied, and this, there's a specific provision process for how to adopt these kind of regulations. And they may not be, so right now there's nothing out there. So theoretically you could adopt this now, there wouldn't be an issue. But if 2127 passes and you're completely preempted, then those other two bills, will, they have the process, they have the procedure for how to adopt these kind of regulations. That's a good point. So there's actual, if, if they say you can pass a regulation which does X, Y, Z, then that meets the provisions of that. So they didn't make anyone's jobs up here easier with this. So. Any, any further discussion on this item? I think it's good to, to make people aware and to start the discussion because I'm sure it will not be the last time we have the discussion. Okay. Uh, I believe that is it then. We will go to mayor and council comments. I'm going to start down on this end with Mayor Pro Tem Mitchum. Hello. Um, I just wanted to say congratulations to the golf course for not having to or potentially not having to um, transfer any money over from the general fund um, and I wanted to further add that that was also accounting for the disruption we would have for construction so like that is a very very big win and then also um, budget as you know, as you heard from my colleagues um, we just spent a nice afternoon together in budget workshop it was the smoothest and best budget workshop I've been to thus far. A lot of great debate, a lot of great comments, and um, a lot of work went into that. Um, and I think, you know, our sales tax is up, and I love that we're going to be able to do more things um, with that and less impact of, you know, the revenue coming from you guys. I'll echo everything that Michelle just said and have no further comments. <laughs> um, yeah, the budget workshop was great. So uh, public kudos to staff who we you know, saw the budget in June, and they had to start working on that two or three months before that. So um, a lot of effort, a lot of work um, went into that, and a lot of thought went into that, and uh, it, it showed. 
Um, now that all comes to a head on August 21st, so uh, keep on paying attention. If you read the budget and have comments or thoughts, please contact us if you have concerns or positive feedback. That's always kind. If you have any of that, please send it send it our way or to, to staff. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's hot. Stay cool as best you can. And Um, I'll, for Lori, I'll ditto the budget comments and, <clears throat> but staff also did a fantastic job. I never get to attend the July 4th event, but I heard from many people that y'all did a fantastic job with it. I know it takes work out of just about every department to make that event a success. And so job well done. I'll echo what everyone else said. Um, I also want to take a moment to say something. Um, a lot of times what people don't see, get to see with us sitting up here is it looks like a, you know, we kind of touched on it earlier today, is that so much of this looks like going through the motions. And something I want to reiterate to everyone is that um, while I respect every single person up here, there is not much that we would all agree on. Uh, I mean, and I think you guys would all, well, you might agree with that statement. Um, <laughs> but that we all have very different ideas and views and opinions about things. And if you come to things, it, not that it's exciting, but if you come to stuff like the budget meeting, you get to see where we disagree and how, but in, you know, why we disagree, but you also see that we have, um, we're all professionals and we do respect each other. So even if I think I'm going to use you in an example, James, since you don't mind, like if I think he's crazy, it's fine. And he thinks the same as me, and that's okay. But we can still, at the end of the day, agree to be professionals and talk about the city and what's best for the city because it, when it comes down to it, every person up here has the city's best interests at heart. So, again, echoing the, uh, the other stuff. Fourth of July. Oh, by the way, the fire department makes a really good brisket. I just feel like it's important that we mention that. C-shift. I'll, I'll call it, the fire department probably cooks great, C-shift. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. C-shift makes an amazing brisket if you're, you know, going to, I don't know if you're going to get hurt, but maybe get hurt on C-shift or need the fire department. <laughs> Make sure they're aware, around. All right. Uh, yeah, as it turns out, guys who put out fires are good at making fires that make good food. Uh, funny how that works, huh? Uh, no, we, we they uh, the guys at Sea Shift, unbeknownst to us, well, or at least I didn't know until uh, they showed up with it that they uh, had cooked some brisket and other stuff uh, for for lunch uh, during our budget retreat, which was great. Uh, so thank you guys for that. Um, rather than echoing, I think everyone else here covered a lot, a lot of really great stuff. I'm just going to echo what I usually say, uh, or what I say more often than not, which is uh, again, there's a lot of stuff going on up here. I mean, between preemption of ordinances and whether that means chickens or goats or cows or bond issues or whatever the case may be um you know by all means any questions you have any concerns you have even if you're just like hey i'm not even sure what in the heck y'all are talking about can you explain it to me um please feel free to reach out whether it's by email or phone um i am happy to sit down and and or if it's the budget and you don't understand some part of it um you know happy to try to go through that and and clarify anything or answer any questions you may have um that that's exactly what we're all here for uh so please do reach out if you've got questions about about that uh as opposed to just running on the social media and saying i think this is what it is but i haven't bothered to ask anyone um <laughs> it's usually not productive for for anyone um so uh yeah that's all i had to say now uh my understanding unless there's any objection uh in discussing with austin there really isn't anything uh any update to provide in the executive session so if there is no objection amongst council members we will skip that for this evening okay so i think that means meeting adjourned thanks everyone